Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Hughes User Group webinar series. We have a thought-provoking session on the role of security and maintaining your operational capability, especially in the wake of a widespread or, un, uh, or any unexpected disruption or crisis. For this, for this very special topic, we have a very special speaker from Fortinet, Jonathan Nguyen, who is a widely published security expert and a frequent speaker at many industry conferences and seminars. He currently leads a strategic programs at Fortinet where he focuses on emerging technologies and key partnerships. Prior to joining Fortinet, he was the security CTO at Verizon Enterprise Solutions. And before that, Jonathan served in the US Foreign Commercial Service. So he has a great uh, career in security and has a good background on this particular topic. My name is Shahid Javed. I'm with the Hughes on Enterprise team and will be your host and moderator for today's presentation. Just a few housekeeping items before we start. Our webinar is being recorded and will be available for on-demand viewing on our website, hughesusergroup.org. Also, please feel free to send in your questions or comments and we'll address those towards the end of the presentation during the Q&A session. Of course, if you run out of time or you may be viewing a recorded version of this webinar, feel free to drop us an email by simply filling out a form on our website. So let's get started. Folks, at the heart of business continuity and resiliency in our network world is security. Security is very important. Security and resilience anytime before, during, or after disruptions has always been top of mind topic of business leaders. And especially with the current crisis we are in and the new normal way of running business, it has become a more relevant topic. And in today's session, Jonathan will lay out some of the best practices and he'll make sure that you learn about the role of security in maintaining operational capabilities especially in, in, in a crisis like uh, the one we live in right now. Jonathan, thank you for joining us, and we welcome you to this session. Without any um, further delay, please take it away. Great, thank you. First, just many, many thanks for your time today um, uh, going to this discussion. Standard disclaimer, uh, so I won't go into belabor that point. So what we're gonna uh, talk about today in, in this session are, are three basic elements, right? The first part is, where are we today with regards to security and, and business continuity and resilience in light of previous events and incidents, uh, the current pandemic, and then looking forward, um, what is the new normal going to look like? How are we going to um, ensure greater security and resilience and this notion of reasonable care, which has been the emerging objective in, in security over the last three years? I'll discuss that. And then finally, I'll talk about what is security going to look like and how do we optimize that? And what is that with regards to service providers and how we go about choosing, selecting, and, and working with our partners uh, like Hughes here? So moving forward, let's take a look at the business continuity and disaster recovery planning. So as noted, my background is about 25 years um, in cybersecurity and business continuity. Um, I helped build and, and lead Verizon's MSSP practice and developed and launched its business continuity practice as well. Um, so within that space, uh, I had a lot of background in actual pandemic planning and response beginning back in 2009 uh, with the um, swine flu, the bird flu, with SARS and, and other uh, types of incidents. And so some lessons learned, I'll take you through the next couple of slides about best practices and some practical realities about business continuity and security, both in this situation and the ones that you may face further down the road. So, as we th first thing we need to do is, you know, before the actual pandemic, whether it's flu or some other large scale disruption, you really need to take a look at your plan. Uh, the business continuity plans, like security plans and controls, are, are entirely perishable. They need to be tested. They need to be reviewed um, on a regular basis, at least once a year. Uh, when I take a look at business continuity plans, I often know that contact information is, is out of date. It's no longer valid. Um, one of the interesting things when we look at that is that people's job change, they move, 
uh, new folks come in. And, and I, I remember specific situations when, when I was working in the government and we were running our drills. You know, we found continuity plans that were out of date. We, we went into bunkers that still had rotary phones, which were completely irrelevant um, in the digital workplace. So those are some of the key underlying things we always need to test to make sure we're ready there. In addition to that, I've often found the communications plans are, are, are a challenge. Um, so it's very important to establish the who. You know, who's going to be your spokesperson? Who are the people they need to reach out to? When? At what point prior to the declaration, post-declaration, et cetera? When do you communicate out to the public what is happening? Um, and what are your communications plan? All those things need to be prepared ahead of time. You don't want to go into a situation and up to then just try to develop a communications plan about who you, who's going to be your spokesperson, when are they going to communicate, and what legally are you allowed to, to, to discuss with the public. So all those things need to be done ahead of time. Um, I also highly advise people to, to work with their local government and their supply chains, especially as you go through tabletop exercises. Uh, those types of drills are really um, invaluable as you begin to discover uh, holes in plans, things that were not thought of, scenarios that were not dreamt of. I think one of the interesting things in conversations with CISOs I've had in the last couple of weeks has been, you know, we had planned for, for regional disruptions, whether they're weather-related uh, earthquakes, uh, natural events, uh, work stoppages, labor dis um, unrest, and in some cases, um, military armed conflict. But I don't think that many of us had really thought that we would actually face a global disruption in the form of an influenza-like uh, pandemic. Uh, and that was always there. But I think actually having it happen um, uh, is a new one. And it begins to strain and, and, and stress the types of plans that we had developed. And so as we go into the actual taking the action part during the pandemic, the most important thing I've seen is the requirement to frequently and regularly communicate. I, I think that as people become more remote and remote working takes hold, the ability to maintain a very predictable set of communication streams is not only reassuring, but it really has, has helped um, some of the folks I've talked to in the last couple of weeks uh, maintain their operations. And, and, and they're doing relatively well given the situation. I have often found that it, it's quite important to track and monitor your staff and really take a look at that morbidity, meaning their wellness and mortality. It's, it's, a, it's a black topic not a lot of people want to talk about. Uh, unfortunately, very few actually test in their business continuity plans. But the practical reality is that you know, we have to look at situations where our folks and our, our stakeholders, our supply chains may become incapacitated and we really need to take a look, a hard look at succession planning. And that points to a common theme in all these preparations, which is you really need to understand your data and your process classifications. What types of data do you have? What's its criticality? Where is it located? Same thing with your workloads and processes, and by extension, the, the people that you work with across the board. And so finally, at the end, end of the event of the incident, we really need to go back and evaluate how well we did. You know, from a business continuity planning side and, and security, uh, I think the key parts are, are resource prioritization. Really understand both for yourself and your service provider and your supplier, supply, your entire supply chain, how are they going to take a look at their internal versus their external requirements uh, and whom are they going to look after first. And so you need to understand from your service provider how much of their resources are they ready to support uh, third parties and, and end users versus their internal requirements. Really understand SLAs and, and uh, ahead of time, understand the criticality of your workflows because it's going to be those SLAs and try to marry those and have those mirrored in your service provider contracting. Also take a look at your enterprise workflows. What can you migrate and what can't you migrate? It's very hard to do accelerated migration planning in the midst of a disruption like the one we, we've had. Um, and then really take a look at remote working plans. You know, did we really test for remote working that would last for more than a quarter? I think fundamentally the new normal is going to look a lot more distributed, a lot more remote working. I think work is increasingly going to become something we do rather than a place we go to. And that calls for a whole slew of changes. And we really need to think about what we used to call enterprise grade capabilities, in both in, in security and resilience within the perimeter now being extended out to that edge. And, and finally, we also need to take a look at concessions. What elements of our security, our privacy, and our compliance programs can we possibly um, 
lighten up a little bit while staying within a reasonable level of care because something's going to have to give in many cases. Resources get strained. The operating environment, it becomes incredibly challenging. What are you going to do? How do you maintain a reasonable level of due care when all of these changes are happening at once? Uh, what you see on the right-hand side is a posting from my good friend Robert Statica. That is the in-house uh, forensics lab slash SOC that he has built. And he's not alone. That is a fairly typical uh, infrastructure uh, that, that some of my friends who are CISOs and Tier 3 SOC uh, administrators uh, have set up in their working environment. It takes a little bit of time, but I think that's a, a practical reality. And that points to the need for what we used to call enterprise-grade capabilities now uh, being deployed to the edge in people's homes. Uh, when we take a look at supply chain considerations, the same thing. You know, understand uh, the force majeure elements of your contractual requirements, these acts of God. Uh, what are you liable for? What are your suppliers liable for? And will they be able to maintain those, those, those contract terms? It's very important when I was running SOX and, and data centers to take a look at redundant uh, suppliers and partners. The ability to provide supplies from any of the four cardinal points, meaning if if uh, uh, transportation routes are disrupted coming in from the south, do I have an alternate vendor coming out of the northeast or west? And then likewise, in terms of working with your, your employees and your customers, extend the same level of review and consideration to your partners. Communication should be steady. They should be predictable. Two ways to fully understand what your partners are, are dealing with. Uh, likewise, understand your contract terms to them. Um, what, what is your um, accounts payable, accounts receivable policies? How will you conduct transactions in a, in a highly distributed ecosystem when people are working from home? And likewise, SLAs. SLAs and expectations go hand in hand. Uh, your work upfront and preparing will go a long way. So as we look towards now, going into the fifth week of, uh, of, uh, of requirements, you know, what are we what are we doing to, to come out of this crisis? And a lot of CISOs I'm speaking with are now thinking about what is the curve as we emerge out of this pandemic? And the first observation is that companies that were cloud native or had migrated significant portions of their digital infrastructure to cloud had a distinct advantage over those who are traditional brick and mortars. And so what you're gonna see coming out of this pandemic is that everyone wants to be cloud native, literally overnight. And they're not going to just migrate the strategic business well, workflows and applications. They're going to try to migrate just about everything. And decisions are going to be made, some of them well, some not so well, some rash, uh, and some well-founded. Hyperscale is going to be key. Uh, as we move to the edge and more computing is going to be done there, as 5G takes hold, you're going to see a tremendous amount of data generated at high speeds. So hyperscale is going to be critical towards that. And I think Fortinet's technology and in our announcements with hyperscale capabilities in our next generation firewalls and our carrier grade protection uh, platforms really will, will, will help companies scale at speed and scope around that. And finally, there, there will be huge shortages, right? So those acute shortages that we're facing today in terms of cloud and security architects will only be exacerbated um, moving forward. And, and so what you're going to see there is going to be a tremendous amount of demand for people who can help enterprises of all sizes with their cloud migration strategies and how do you secure that. And so this is where your partners like Hughes becomes very critical. I've often said that cybersecurity is not a DIY exercise. And so picking the right partners is, 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 is critical. And so one of the recommendations that came out of the, the current situation is being more widely adopted, in fact, it's gained, uh, gained adoption and accelerated in demand, is this notion of zero trust. And why is that? Because zero trust was founded on this idea that traffic inside the perimeter should be trusted no more than traffic outside the perimeter. The backdrop about this from, from my work at, 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 at MSSPs and within Fortinet and, and using the FortiGuard labs what we found is this. Here's the practical reality of where we are in cybersecurity today. Even though we spend on average $120 billion a year, some 4 to 5% of all end users consistently click on just about anything and routinely fail security awareness training. 28% of the attacks are done by, attack, by insiders. 17% of the breaches are caused by simple human error or some combination of human error. And some approximation between 77 and 80% of all data breaches are discovered by victims, law enforcement, 
third parties. They are not discovered by the internal security team. I think that's a very, very telling statistic. It says that even with whatever, everything that we know at the past levels of complexity, on the, for the vast majority of companies, they're not detecting data breaches. They're only detecting when it's, the data has been exploited and victims uh, become identified. The practical reality as well is that 99% of all the vulnerabilities that were exploited were already known and signatures were available. You know, if you need further proof of that, uh, here's this article that was just published. The vast majority of 2019 breaches resulted from unapplied security patches. So we fail on security hygiene. And all of those challenges are going to be accelerated and exacerbated as we move into a post-pandemic uh, operating environment where things are more, more uh, distributed and there's more remote working. Now, NIST has come out with a series of guidelines on what it perceives to be the new operating reality in cyberspace. And the first is that you have to assume hostile, malicious intent. You have to assume that your network and the networks, networks through which your traffic is coursing is a hostile environment, and it, it has been compromised. We're also going to have to assume that those networks and facilities, devices, will all contain hostile threats. We need to assume that also there are malicious parties who have gained control of the teleworking agents on those devices. And so what does that mean? It's, it means that if you have to assume that you've already been breached, your data has been compromised, then zero trust in and of itself also is limited, right? So zero trust is a good best practice, but it's not the end all be all. I think at the end of the day, because we have to assume that we've been breached, literally we have to assume that zero trust has failed in some ways, we need to look at AI and behavioral-based detection, right? So if you assume that you've been breached and you assume the compromise has happened, you're gonna need to look at a huge amount of data across a very large digital ecosystem. And that's where our products and network access controls, our SIM technology, our UVA capability, our AI capability, and our intelligence capabilities provide you that visibility of understanding. I also say, take a hard look at, 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 at risk research because if everything fails, you're gonna need a capability to take a look at the dark web marketplaces and see if anyone's targeting you. Is anyone asking questions about you and your organization? Is anyone offering information about you? Um, and I think that begins to form what we call a reasonable level of care. As we take a look at another pandemic lessons, there are new known unknowns. You know, when we take a look at behavioral-based detection and anomalous behavioral-based detection, so what happens when everything is new? What happens when the vast majority of, of login sessions and, and, and requests for network access are all new? You know, going into this pandemic uh, situation, on average, some 15 to 24, maybe 25 percent of any enterprise organization was working remotely. In the federal government, most of the agencies there, between 15 to 20 percent of their employees were working remotely. Now we have the inverse. We have 80, 85 percent. Of, of staff working remotely and everything is new. And everything is new in terms of logins, in terms of uh, behavior in the network traffic, but at the same time, we're facing more targeted attacks, um, more sophisticated attacks, more opportunistic attacks, more automated attacks across the board. And so that begins to challenge the ability of implementing uh, these zero trust principles at speed and scale. So my suggestion to everyone is this, to drill deeper down, but use the AI capabilities, use the SIM capabilities, uh, work with your service providers to focus on the privileged access holders, focus on people who have the keys to your kingdom, right? Root, at, root access, admin access, look at your sysadmins. As, as one person once told me who was an APT for a nation state, he said, look, if you want to defend against people like us, you know, hunt your sysadmins, because that's who we hunt, right? So focus on those people and baseline the new behavior and detect anomalous behavior and then move move forward, up forward and, and outwards into your organization, organization as you begin to baseline what normal looks like in this new normal. And that's where I think that the research on threat intelligence becomes so critical. So, and at the same time, this came out and said, look, you can't protect what you can't see. Uh, what is really quite telling amongst all of their recommendations, uh, as even though we discussed cloud and migration and virtualized workflows, there is still a need for perimeter-based defenses because the practical reality is that 
we've now worked in a very hybrid environment. We work in, in, in our homes, we work in branch offices, we work in headquarters behind traditional perimeters, we have private data centers and private clouds, and we have workloads distributed across a half a dozen or more public cloud service providers. And so what we have still amidst all these changes, still a recommendation that says, hey, if possible, a service should be placed at an organization's network perimeter, right? To be the gateway through which traffic is inspected. And so I found one of the easiest ways of doing that is to work with an MSSP. Folks like Hughes, well positioned to do that, to do that at scale, to allow folks like yourselves to, to take a look at your competency. So when we look at zero trust and zero, where did it come from? Well, I will tell you as a victim of the OPM data breach, because of my, my work with US government, um, it came from OPM. So while Zero Trust was invented in, by Forster in 2009, 2010, that time period, it really only gained traction after the OPM breach. And what you saw there was a classic series of failures um, that were revealed by, by a congressional task force in an investigation. And it basically came down to a recommendation that Zero Trust should be implemented across federal agencies to prevent what is arguably the largest and most uh, damaging of all data breaches in history. 23 million Americans, uh, whoever held, applied for security clearance. Their, their data is compromised. In fact, there is no way to remediate that. The only, we're basically going to have to wait until, until everybody dies out is unfortunate. Uh, but the lessons learned from that are outlined here. They're pretty basic and fundamental. Um, but that led to the adoption of, of zero trust and, and the drive um, demand for that, if you will. So what is it exactly? So, look, zero trust is not a product. It's, it's not a solution. It, it is an operational framework that is iterative, meaning that it's still evolving. But what it really does at the end of the day is that it shifts the focus from static network segments to focus on where the data is, the data in terms of where is it uh, being used, what assets is it associated with, and what resources. That's where zero trust focuses. It, it assumes the idea that there is no implicit trust based on the location right, uh, whether it's a network location or physical location. You should not trust a request for network access or traffic, uh, whether it's inside the perimeter or outside the perimeter. Uh, and it notes that authentication and authorization needs to be done before the, the access is ever granted. It also says, hey, you know, we have to take a look at security uh, as something beyond the perimeter. Um, and we begin to take a look at protecting the data. But there are also some limitations. It's an iterative approach, and, and it's still evolving in many ways. And, and there are some things that I would add, and we'll talk about that next. So look, as, as you begin to combine what NIST has said and the background of zero trust, you begin to see the themes about where I think security is going to go and what reasonable care is going to look at. I think the underlying assumptions are all, host all networks are hostile, that cyberspace is indeed a hostile operating environment, a multi-dimensional hostile operating environment, which is uh, a big step for us, I think, uh, in, in, in private sector especially. We have to consume uh, our networks, our people, our devices, our systems are under continuous attacks. We have to assume that we've been compromised. You have to assume that you've already been breached in many ways, um, and that all the users all the devices and all the traffic must be verified, monitored, logged, if you will. Uh, and then I would add this element because it wasn't added before. I think the final disposition of what was accessed needs to be accounted for as well. Um, because if you take a look at 28% of the breaches are caused by insiders. So what may look normal uh, may not be. And so the ability to say, hey, yeah, what is Jonathan Nguyen doing? He's accessing uh, the, the mail server, that's legitimate. He's accessing documents that are in a cloud um, server, that's legitimate. What's he doing? Is he altering that? Or is he downloading it? Is he downloading it to attach storage media? Is he uploading it to another cloud? Understanding what a user does with what was accessed becomes key to determining what was malicious. I, I think this cartoon is very telling because it really says, look, everyone is telling you what is happening in this environment. Um, and I think leadership teams and boards need to be cognizant of the fact that if we assume the attacks have already compromised the network and you've been breached, the object of the exercise is to deliver a reasonable level of due care. What does reasonable level of due care look like for your organization? That's the number one question to ask. And when we take a look at zero trust architectures, as we said again, 
and, and moving left to right. In the previous working models, there was implicit trust. If you were inside the perimeter, you were trusted. The implications are that if an attacker were able to get in, then he or she were able to move laterally, compromise data, and ultimately export, exfiltrate that data. In a zero trust environment, the users, the networks, the applications are not trusted, and you only get access after your identity has been authenticated, the device on which you, you're using to make that request has been identified and verified. The specific request for network access, whatever application workflow that you're asking for is validated, and then log and monitor everything. And that becomes a, 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 the new operating model. The challenge, how do you do this at speed and at scale? So when I take a look at that, I think it always begins with understanding the risk that your organization faces. Assume that's a hostile environment, assume that they're malicious actors, but then take a look at your business goals. Look at your assets, look at your access infrastructure, and finally look at those threats in light of the risk that you face, and what are the steps that you need to undertake to, make, to, to, to control that? So, uh, you know, not, nothing terribly new here, but I wanted to frame it out. I wanted you all to have a copy of these basic things to, to take a look at. Um, and when you take a look at the, the requirements to look at every user, every device, to log and monitor for the time and geophysical location, uh, to monitor for the requested um, application or workflow, you know, and then to do a contextual assessment of whether that's valid or not and what's the risk associated with that particular request, you know, that's a pretty broad operating environment. Now, we're looking at everything from you know, IoT, IIoT, Edge, smart factories, connected homes, connected cars, connected platforms, smart cities, traditional branch offices, headquarters offices, and then out to a series of public clouds. That's a pretty broad operating environment. Now, put that onto a global scale, and I think the only way we, need, we can do this is to manage complexity. So platform consolidation is going to accelerate. We need to move away from point defense products and platforms to something that's built design by product, uh, like a Fortnite security fabric, right? I think that's, that's a reasonable approach. These are more questions um, that you can use to take a look at how to assess that risk. I won't belabor them here, but they're pretty self-explanatory. And so, so now let me show you how uh, I, I do this for, for a lot of enterprise businesses and service providers when I advise them on you know, my background on, on what reasonable care looks like, what effective security looks like, uh, and how do we do that um, by employing uh, zero trust networking principles, uh, an updated approach around network segmentation uh, to deliver what I consider to be reasonable care. And I think it starts off with our Fortnite security fabric you know, there, there are three things that, that all security solutions need to be able to address. It has to be broad. Why? Because we work in a very broad operating environment. You have to be able to, to see across your entire ecosystem, right? Which now for many organizations includes the homes of thousands of, of employees and other stakeholders. It has to be integrated because all these points of presence across an ecosystem have to be able to collect and generate information so that information can be curated, so that you have a contextual understanding of what's happening in your ecosystem, but also the threats that are challenging it. And once you understand what's happening, if you decide to take action, it has to be automated. One of the things that are happening is the accelerated pace of computing and networking. 5G will only accelerate that. 5G is 100 times faster than 4G. So unless security can operate at networking speeds, security becomes increasingly irrelevant. And so that's why you need something that is a fabric that's broad, it's integrated and automated, and it's built to purpose. It's built to work that way rather than trying to do it yourself. I will tell you from my own practical experience that as an operator, I want my SOC teams, my analysts to work on operating technology. I do not want my teams focused on systems integration, technology integration, or, or QA work, right? Uh, the more that I can do that with a series of strategic partners, vendors, um, the better my abilities to manage complexity and actually address threats across this ecosystem. So when we take a look at a zero trust architecture, look, trust shouldn't be established by any one IP address. You have to have a contextual assessment. You have to be able to take a look at all the data address. It's got to have the right users using the right approved devices, um, it, using the right privilege to get to the right resources, and a continuous assessment and visibility. Um, zero trust should not end by on the granting of access. You have to be able to monitor 
sessions end to end and then over time to see whether there's any pattern of malicious or anomalous activity, right, that suggests uh, something bad has happened. You've got to verify the user identity. You know, when you take a look at those credentials, one of the key things about threat research is the ability to look at credentials and see whether they've been compromised, to see whether they've been part of other um, malicious activities. And so having access to things like FortiGuard Labs is a key. Multi-factor authentication is one of the top four recommendations for security control. Um, and I won't belabor that point, but my research uh, has, has demonstrated that using multi-factor authentication for access and for especially around the critical workflows you know, improves your security capabilities by almost 25%. That's the empirical research. Uh, verify the device. Is that a corporate device? Is it BYOD? Is it vulnerable? Is it IoT? The challenge now, and I've seen a lot of CISOs struggling with this, is how do you search capabilities to provide corporate approved devices for 80 plus percent of your work, work staff now? Um, one of the things I noticed here in Northern Virginia was in the, in the days and weeks after the uh, declaration of a, of, a, of a crisis, there were no laptops available. All of the local governments and the national government had already uh, laid their hands in and, 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 and uh, contracted for that. And so uh, trying to work uh, security across uh, multiple BYOD devices and ensuring that vulnerable devices are detected and, and quarantined is tough uh, unless you have a security fabric-based approach. Likewise, when we take a look at applications and service and access, you have to be able to, to look across all of that to provide context. And that's how we provide uh, zero trust network access. And so with us, as we go through uh, the, the fabric itself, and, it, and it's our ability to have visibility and control across that, to dynamically assess and control access based upon identity, based upon the trusted level uh, that, that is detected, the compliance check of the device itself, the authentication across the board, and then the ability to do the incident investigation should we find something that doesn't look right, if it's anomalous or not. And then, of course, segmentation, everything from IoT, across that ecosystem using those next generation firewalls. One of the lessons I learned from CISOs uh, is that as you have a more distributed workforce, you're gonna have a lot of people doing multiple roles, roles they haven't done before. In this case, what we, what we see is we've got Kate here, who's normally in engineering, but now she has been assigned to work with sales. And because of the ability to assign tags to the FortiGates now, and the ability to detect whether they're vulnerabilities, you can dynamically, uh, change access, you can block devices and users until their devices have gone through quarantine or properly patched. We can also dynamically ensure that as her roles change, we can ensure that she doesn't access information and workflows and applications that she used to do in the, in the prior set. So now as, as Kate has is, is moved from engineering to maybe now a systems engineer in role sporting sales, she now only has access to, to the sales internet. And then we can monitor for the changes in baseline behavior and see whether something an, an anomalous is occurring. That is a critical fact. If you're doing manual policy changes, you're gonna struggle. And the FortiGate users I've seen in the last couple of weeks were able to do this in a pretty seamless way in the scale um, at speed. And that, that has be, that's become key. So last couple of slides. The way I look at, at, at access controls in the zero trust environment is, is as follows. You know, we're going to identify the geophysical location of where that request for access is coming in. We're going to authenticate uh, using credentials and certs on who it is, the devices they're, 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 they're using to make the request, what workflows they're, they're, they're trying to uh, access, is it valid? And then we're going to note the timestamp. And with that, you can baseline behavior. What, and then over time, look what normal. I often suggest if you have no guidance on what new normal looks like, take in a small increment do 5% deviations from norm. After a couple of days, after five working days, you're gonna have a pretty rudimentary idea of what the new normal looks like. But begin to take standard 5% deviations from norm and refine that over time. In about three weeks, you're gonna have a very good idea of, of what your new operating environment looks like. But focus on your privileged access users. And by doing that, what we get is this notion of adaptive trust. We can get no access, we can get guest access, you can restrict access. You can also uh, give unrestricted access, something which I, I, I would not recommend, but that capability is there. Um, and that's how we're going to control access in a zero trust environment uh, using the Fortinet fabric. And, and so 
I would also say that our SIM capabilities, our user entity behavioral analysis capabilities, gives you that visibility into what Jonathan is doing, uh, whether it's uh, in your cloud, a public cloud, and to understand what he has done with the data. Um, that's key from a CIA perspective. And finally, you know, I'll summarize by this. Um, our new normal is going to be much more distributed. It's going to be more complex, and unfortunately, it's going to be more hostile. Um, I think across the board, we need to think about how we're going to support our enterprises as more work is done in connectionless ways, connectionless commerce, healthcare, medicine, uh, if you will, telemedicine, um, public services as well. And the irony of that is that these connectionless uh, transactions require more interconnectedness, if you will, between devices, more complexity, more data, and I think across the board, zero trust uh, is, is going to be accelerated in its implementation. And at the end of it all, focus on reasonable care on CIA. CIA is just as um, relevant now as it was when I first started in cyber sometime in the mid-90s. So I leave you with uh, this last cartoon uh, on a light note. Uh, but I, I, I will tell you that it's been interesting to, uh, to watch how people have responded uh, to remote working. And um, the biggest insight I had is not what happened, but what hasn't happened. Um, I think for the most part, the security professionals I've spoken with were able to execute their plans. Um, and then without major uh, catastrophic disruptions, uh, begin to secure and enable uh, their, their working environment. Time will tell how effective we were. Um, you know, we go out 90 days, 180 days, and we'll find out how successful we were at, at detecting and mitigating data breaches during this incident. With that, I want to thank you for your time. Uh, it's been an honor to be with you. I'll turn it back over to Shahid and um, see if there are any questions. Thanks again. Hey, Jonathan, thank you very much. Thank you for um, your insights and outlining um, practical and actionable approaches to ensuring security and continuity of operations. Um, um, folks, we we have um, just a couple of minutes. Um, if you have more questions, please send them in. I do have a couple of questions that came out and I'm going to ask you, Jonathan. Um, one is, um, how can uh, CIOs and uh, CISOs ensure um, uh, that um, you know, hack in that uh, the, the, they protect their company during COVID-19, um, especially this crisis. How can this stay ahead of the hackers? Any advice there? Yeah, yeah. So I think the first part, look, uh, my research was into the root cause analysis of over 16,000 data breaches. And there are four basic things that we should all be doing. Uh, we should all be implementing the SIS-20, the basic security controls, focus on security hygiene, security awareness training more than ever is important because uh, your remote workers are the front line and they are being targeted, right? So security awareness training is really important given the fact that 4% of our employees routinely click on anything. Use of multi-factor authentication is absolutely key. Uh, as I said before, uh, in, in my experience and the research that, that my teams have done, we've demonstrated that the use of multi-factor authentications and access and specifically around your critical workflows and applications will really reduce uh, the, the number of attacks that lead to data breaches by, by upwards to 25%. Uh, finally, I would take a very strong look at web application vulnerability management as well, because that's what's going to be attacked. Um, so the object of the exercise in security is a reasonable level of care. It goes back to British common law. Uh, it's based on a lot of cases, uh, namely Equifax, which was, which was uh, litigated uh, about a year ago. And the idea comes down to this. What would a reasonable person do knowing what he or she knows? And what do we know right now? Given the NIST guidelines, it's a hostile, multi-dimensional operating environment. Your networks have been compromised. Your networks are likely breached. If you know all that, what did you do? When did you do it? And was that reasonable? And, and when you talk to your leadership team, that's the way you frame the discussion. You know, what do we know today? When did we know it today? What did we do about it? Do we have a plan to address those issues? It's better to have a plan than not. You can identify weaknesses and shortcomings, but it's imperative you have a plan of action, right? And then the final question, and a lot of times boards ask me, it's like, well, did I spend enough? Did I do enough? And the question comes back, and it goes back onto the CIO or the CISO's shoulders. 
Uh, in fact, actually now the entire board is, if someone says, is that reasonable, you know, you, be, you have to be able to stand with your decision. In one case in particular, I no, noted during an arbitration environment, the opposing counsel said, they, they asked the, um, the, the C member uh, of this one organization, what do you do personally at home? And this person outlined a very robust model. And then they said, if you do that for yourself, what type of security do you put in place for your, for your organization? You have a fiduciary responsibility. So, so focus on, on reasonable care and, and those controls. And I, that's why I gave my email address as well. Happy to continue the discussions with you offline. Just, just ping me. You'll find me on LinkedIn. You'll find me that email address, and I'll be, be happy to, to work with you. Thank you, Jonathan. Uh, there's one more question that is really interesting, and I'm going to ask that. Um, during the recent, it's all about the, the recent pandemic, uh, coronavirus pandemic. Um, given that we have uh, constraints in our resources, there are, um, for management, there's a priority that needs to be done. Should we focus more on cybersecurity responsibility, or should we focus more on assisting with IT-related tasks? So there's, that's, that's the balance about um, understanding the criticality of your data, your workflows, processes, and, and your obligations. Uh, it's very critical as you decide how you prioritize your resources. What are your obligations um, to your shareholders if you're publicly traded, to the public if you're a public sector agency? Uh, what are your obligations to your customers and your vendors? Um, it's very important to bring in people like your general counsel, your risk manager, to understand your contractual obligations. Are there force majeure um, um, language in your contracts that gives you uh, the protections in this space? What happens if you can't meet those obligations? And so, look, I, I, would, I would advise back to reasonable care. There is no one answer that fits everybody. Uh, and that's why in your business continuity uh, planning, you really need to take a look at uh, under what circumstances and conditions can you um, give uh, uh, in, in terms of contractual obligations. Um, that's what I would look at. Uh, but again, it's individual by organization. And that's why in many cases, cybersecurity and, and resilience go hand in hand. It's not formulaic. Um, a lot of it is going to be more art than science. Um, my guidance would be uh, focus on what you're obligated to do. Uh, bring your, your legal teams into it. Bring your HR teams. It is a it's, a, it's a, you know, a large operating environment, right? Um, and we can certainly take this offline. You've got my contact information if you want to discuss this um, in your particular environment. Happy to support that. Well, thank you very much, folks. That's all the time we have. Uh, Jonathan, thank you very much for, for, for this session. Uh, please um, visit our website, hughesusergroup.org. We'll have a recording of this presentation there. We'll have Jonathan's contact information there as well. It's also in the beginning of the presentation. Um, or you can just search him on Google. He, he's, he shows up <laughs> all over the place. Um, uh, thank you very much. Thank you for the presentation, and have a good day. Likewise. Thanks again. Bye.